All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are once again. My name is Mengs, and today it's time for me to expose myself to more suffering for your entertainment. I recently did Advanced Wars 2, and then I did Days of Ruin, so I suppose the only reasonable thing to do is to continue this series with a dual strike. One of the more controversial entries into the Wars franchise. This game has a very mixed reception among the community. Some people love it for its innovative mechanics and new COs, while other people hate it for its blatant imbalance and strange decision making. Me, myself, I both love and hate it. It's a bit of a mixed bag. But the question is, will I still love it after I'm done with this challenge? Most likely not. So today I'm going to try and beat Advanced Wars Dual Strike without losing a single unit. You guys surely know the drill at this point. I'll be playing through the hard campaign and the goal is to get through each mission with zero losses, which I can check in the status screen as well as on the post-game battle report after each mission has been cleared. Rankings does not matter, how I beat a mission does not matter, and I am allowed to join my units together as that does not count as a loss. However, Dual Strike is a bit of a weird beast, because the hard campaign allows you to freely play around with all the COs in the game, including some of the really broken ones, like the main villain. For this reason, many consider this campaign pretty trivial, even though it has some absurdly hard missions. Because you can do things like pick Kumbai or Von Bolt on certain pre-deployed missions, which absolutely breaks them apart. And then on top of that, you have the skills, which is a new mechanic brought into Dual Strike. And it is actually one of my favorite things about the game, because it allows you to modify your COs in very creative ways, giving them more firepower, more defense, making their powers charge faster, etc. And this is very exciting, especially in competitive matches, because I feel like your choice of skills add a lot of depth to the matchups. However, in a campaign that already allows you to cheese it with certain COs, adding skills on top of that can just turn maps into absolute jokes. For example, some maps are made with a lot of terrain to deliberately slow your units down, but you can pick skills that allows free movement through plains and forests, and with those, you can absolutely stomp these maps because they are not designed around this. Furthermore, some of the later skills you unlock are comparable in power to using cheat codes. Take Soul of Hachi, for example, which allows you to purchase units in cities during your superpower. Then you have Mistwalker, which states that it hides your units during superpower, but this is actually a programming error. What it actually does does is allow your units to first strike during superpower similar to Sonya's counter break, which is still broken. Due to this, I've decided to add another restriction to this already crazy run. I have decided to just ban skills altogether. You may think this is absolutely crazy, but I actually believe this challenge is doable without them. Now, will I regret this decision at some point down the line? Uh, yeah, most likely, but I'm still going to stick to my guns, and let us see how it goes. Before we start though, there is another issue with Dual Strike that I have to clarify. Sometimes you're forced to do battle on two fronts. This is all well and good, but for some reason, a few of these maps forces you to let the AI play the second front for you, and you don't have the option to take control of it. I obviously cannot be responsible for any losses I incur when the AI controls the second front, so I will ignore those. But otherwise, I have to get through the entire hard campaign without losing a single unit. Can I do it? Well. Let's find out. Mission 1, Jake's Trial, is a very infamous map because in the Heart Campaign, I would classify it as maybe one of the most difficult missions in the entire game. Definitely not the hardest, but it's possibly in my top 5. This is because your opponent on this map is none other than Rachel, one of the most annoying new COs added to Dual Strike. Her superpower launches three missiles on your units, which is already bad enough on its own, but in a deathless run like this, it pretty much spells disaster and an immediate reset. For this reason alone, I'm gonna have to bring in the power duo of Colin and Sasha. Expect to see these guys a lot in this video, by the way. Colin is mostly here for support, as he synergizes very well with his sister, granting her three tag stars, which equates to a 15% bonus to luck damage, but the real star of this run is going to be Sasha. Her ability to use Market Crash to disable the enemy's power meter is going to be absolutely key to winning this challenge. This will not only prevent enemy dual strikes further down the line, which is essential, but on this map, it means we can disable Rachel's most dangerous weapon, her missiles. Or at the very least, we can try. 
This map is also tricky because the most expensive units we can deploy are tanks, and Rachel cheats and starts out with three medium tanks coming straight at us, though they are all damaged, which is nice. We can luckily use our mechs to choke point these tanks before they enter the fray, and the reason I let Colin start out as the lead CO on this mission is because that allows me to get an artillery out on day one thanks to his 20% discount. After that, however, I switch over to Sasha to start building up her power meter. On day two, I move my mech towards the southern base to try and capture it, while also being wary of Rachel's units as they can quickly close the distance. I also have to be careful to keep joining my mechs together to prevent losing a unit, but also to keep the medium tanks in check. With my artillery in place, I can start grinding down Rachel's tanks, but she gains power fast from this, and I have to pop my first power to try and keep it down. Sasha's market crash reduces the enemy power meter by 10% for every 5,000 funds she has in her bank, and while it only costs 2 stars to activate it, there is a diminishing returns mechanic present which boosts the price of powers by 20% for each time you pop them in a battle. And this stacks, by the way, so as the match goes on, it will be progressively harder to keep the missiles in check. I also need to ensure that I activate this power at the end of my turn, but before I purchase my units, to maximize its effects. On day 5, Rachel charges at me with a huge army, and I'm starting to feel seriously threatened. I may be able to contain her superpower, but her massive units is another thing entirely, as Sasha doesn't have any passive firepower or defense boosts. However, as long as I can target fire Rachel's scary units like her tanks, I should in theory be fine. However, I get a little too careless as I start destroying her units, and I forget to monitor her power meter, resulting in her covering fire being ready on the next turn. And this spells disaster for my troops. As the missiles hit my forces one by one, they are easy pickings for the rest of Rachel's units to clean up, and thus I have to surrender. On my second try, I get a bit of an idea that might help me in reducing Rachel's power meter. After I activate my first market crash, I immediately tag over to Colin and pop Gold Rush on the following day. And this gives me some additional funds to work with, which will severely increase the potency of market crash. This is one of the reasons why these two are so great together. Their powers are literally designed to work in unison. On day 8, Rachel has a full power meter charged up, but I have 35,000 funds in the bank, which almost completely erases it with a single market crash. I tag over to Colin again just for fun to pop another Gold Rush and increase my bank to 43,000. You guys see how utterly broken this game is? There are so many ways to cheese the missions on hard mode, which is why I both love it and hate it at the same time. With her superpower nowhere near ready, Rachel is powerless to stop me as I barge into her base and wipe her out. It is deceptively scary to attack her on this map though, as she actually has three bases, and her units do repair faster, so you need to overpower them before they can pose a threat to you. Still, despite this, on day 13, with no losses, I'm able to mop up Rachel's final unit to clear the map. And yeah, this game is also insanely lenient with its S rank requirements, so expect to see a lot of those. Mission 2, The New Black, is where we truly start to see how cheesable the hard campaign is. On this map, we start with a bunch of artillery, and we have to fend off a large and waiting force before they can reach us. We have to protect this one HP infantry unit from dying, and we'll get a game over if we fail to do so, but I never found that it was in any real danger to begin with. We also start with a neotank down in the south to protect our HQ from being captured. Our opponent for this map is Jugger, a new CO added to Dual Strike. He is a much more volatile version of Flak from Advanced Wars 2, which makes him very annoying to go up against in a deathless run. On a day-to-day -day basis, his units can roughly do 30% extra luck damage, but when he pops his normal power, this rises to 55%, and when he pops his super, he can do a terrifying 95% extra damage, which is something that can easily force a reset. Luckily, this mission can be won without us having to engage his forces much at all, by simply selecting the duo of Grit and Max. Like Colin before him, Max is just here for his two tank stars, while Grit is going to take center stage and blast away Jugger with his overpowered artillery. Thanks to Grit's plus one range on indirect, this mission becomes an absolute joke, as my artillery can just begin blasting away at Jugger's troops right away. As long as I take care to focus fire his mechs first, as they can actually threaten me by darting across the river, I have no issue blasting away the rest of his troops before they even get near me. 
What's also interesting about using Grid on this mission is that normally Jugger will ignore your near tank and dart straight for the choke point. But with Grid's minus 20% firepower, the AI suddenly feels confident enough to attack it head on. This means that the Neo tank alone can hold up the entire southern force, and I can use all of my artillery to blast the north side. As if my artillery aren't already good enough, I can also pop snipe attack to make them even better, turning this mission into a complete cakewalk. Towards the end of the map, Jugger does eventually activate a system crash, but I've taken care to reduce most of his unit's HP down to 3 or below. Like with the other games, luck damage will scale with a unit's health, so a unit at 3 HP only has 30% of its total luck value, meaning the damage it can do is pretty minor even if Jugger rolls maximum luck. Realizing that it can't hurt my Neo tank, the AI instead opts to go for an HQ cap, but that's not really possible either, as the infantry are all damaged. After I clean up Jugger's remaining forces, I tag over to Max for style points, and on day 7, with no losses, I smash Jugger's final APC to win the map. In Mission 3, Max Attacks, is where we normally get access to Max. In the normal campaign, anyhow. This is the hard campaign, so we can use whoever we want. On this map, we start out with a bunch of battlecopters, and there's four mini cannons on the field which we can destroy to increase our mobility. However, there's also a new black hole super weapon coming our way, the Black Bomb. This thing is new to Dual Strike, and it's pretty much an air unit that can blow itself up to deal five damage to all units in a huge area. The Black Bomb is a rather controversial unit. It's pretty much banned in any competitive Advanced Wars match, and most people don't like it very much. On this mission, you pretty much have no choice but to tank the Black Bomb as you can't shoot it down. But after that, your Battlecopters have free reign to do as they please as your opponent has no anti-air units. Speaking of your opponent, this time you're up against Lash, and she got nerfed pretty hard in Dual Strike, as she now only gets 5% firepower increase per terrain star, down from the 10% she used to get in Advanced Wars 2. I guess even the developers fell into the noob trap of overvaluing Lash as a CO. Since this mission is focused on Battlecopters, I decided to go with the most broken duo in Dual Strike, the Grizzled Vets themselves, Sensei and Hachi. Hachi, for as broken as he normally is, is actually just here to give two tag stars to his partner. Sensei, on the other hand, is here to kick some serious ass. He did get changed quite considerably in Dual Strike as he no longer has weak vehicles, but his infantry only has 10% firepower now, down from 40%. But luckily, his battlecopters are still as broken as ever, and we start out with 9 of them. Strictly speaking, destroying all of the mini cannons is not necessary at all. I just do it out of habit because they give a lot of experience to rank up your COs, and I do this even though I maxed out every single one in the game. On day 2 I clean all of the cannons up, and then I disperse all of my battlecopters out as much as possible in preparation for the incoming black bomb. If done well, the bomb shouldn't hit more than two of your copters, and at this point there's not even any further need to attack Lash. You can just use a single battlecopter to block the one choke point leading back to her HQ, while two of your other battlecopters protect your units around your own HQ, and then you can just send the transport copter down to seize her HQ. The funny thing is, you don't even need to play Sensei to do this. A CEO like Jess would have been able to pull it off just fine. I just did it for the lols. On day 5, with no losses, I am able to win easily, but just because I enjoy my S rank, I destroy a few of Lash's units before capping her HQ. What can I say? I, I just like to see those points go up. In Mission 4, Reclaim the Skies, we get introduced to one of the dumbest new gimmicks introduced in Dual Strike. Timed missions. Actual, real timed missions. You have 30 real minutes to clear this map before a missile strikes Omegalon, but you don't really need more than two, so that's pretty much something you can just ignore. This mission is a very simple pre-deployed map where you have to fight a bunch of air units with anti-air units. Sounds kinda easy, but your opponent is a jugger and he has a lot of bombers with unpredictable luck damage. So I decide to bring in the master of pre-deployed warfare, the Emperor himself, Kumbai, and his trusty daughter. Kumbai is nerfed slightly in Dual Strike, as he now only has 20% increased firepower in defense, down from the 30% he used to have in Advanced Wars 2. But he's still by far the best CO you can pick for any pre-deployed battle, and the three tank stairs he gets from his daughter are very nice too. This mission is all about using your units effectively to destroy as many of Jugger's forces as possible. The bombers are the high priority targets, but you can't reach them all due to the water, so you just want to ensure that there are as few enemy forces left to deal damage to you as possible. 
Due to the insane amount of damage you inflict on Jugger, there's little you can do to prevent him from activating System Crash on day one, and this does turn the mission into a bit of an RNG fest due to his luck damage. But luckily, Defense really counteracts luck in a big way, which is why Kumba is so effective here. In fact, I decide to pop Morale Boost at the end of my turn, specifically for the 10% extra defense, so I can reduce as much of Jugger's luck damage as possible. I do end up having to reset twice on this mission, as it's quite easy to get one of your units picked off by Jugger's bombers, but on my third try, I get some good RNG on Jugger's luck damage, combined with me knowing how to properly position my units. And on day three, with no losses, and barely two minutes of real time spent, I clean up the last enemy unit and earn myself another 300 points S rank. Mission 5, Never Ending War, proves to be the first real roadblock of this challenge. This map looks deceptively trivial at first, as it's just a standard battle with some mini cannons on the enemy side. However, this battle is a lot more than it seems, because we are still not allowed to build anything more advanced than tanks, artillery and anti-air, while the enemy can deploy neo tanks and bombers. Furthermore, we are up against Cole, a new CO added to Dual Strike that is essentially an adder clone with an added bonus on roads. Movement CEOs are pretty tricky to go up against in a Deathless challenge because you have to constantly account for their units suddenly being faster. And when those are already high move units like Neo Tanks and Bombers, it becomes even more scary. Since I don't really have any good way of dealing with such powerful threats, I decide to go with the duo of Nell and Rachel. Thanks to Rachel's three tag stars, Nell's 20% day-to-day -day luck gets boosted to 35%. That's almost like having a constant Rachel normal power active at all times. With that level of luck damage, it should allow my weaker units to inflict significant damage to Cole's vehicles, and particularly my artillery becomes quite deadly. As I begin this map, I remember just how annoying it is. Cole starts out with two battlecopters, which can go either north or south, and they seem to go wherever it's most inconvenient to me. My starting incomes suck, and I struggle to afford anti-air early on, and if I want to try and grab the northern base, which is kind of important, I get intercepted by a tank and an anti-air, which is incredibly rough to deal with in conjunction with the battlecopter. I have to reset several times just to find a good opener, as it is extremely hard to find balance between two fronts when I am so incredibly low on income. But the real problem begins when Cole starts sending Neo tanks my way. As Cole enters my base with several scary vehicles, my dual strike is almost ready, and while I would have absolutely loved to use it, I am forced to activate Lady Luck to deal with the invading forces. I roll pretty well on my luck rolls and I am able to eliminate the Neo tank, but the problems don't stop there. Cole keeps spamming more of them into my base, and when he activates his powers, even my units on cities risk getting one shot, especially considering there's a lot of roads on this map. So I realize that while luck damage is nice, I will need some defense if I am to successfully defend against Neo tanks. So I decide to switch up my strategy and pick Von Bolt as my main CO instead, as he gets a passive 10% defense boost. It may not sound like a lot, but it makes a big Big difference when you go up against Neo tanks. Now, I could have picked Kumbai for 20% increased defense, but I'd rather not deal with the extra deployment cost when my economy is already in such a ragged state. I also decide to pick Cole as my partner, mostly because his short power meter means I can charge up a dual strike without having to swap over to him. And because as a member of the Bolt Guard, Cole does not have the 90% penalty when tagging with Von Bolt that nearly every other CO in the game have. With Von Bolt as my main CO, it's a lot easier to deal with Cole's Neo Tank, as they don't one-shot most of my units on planes, though I do have to be careful not to let him get his road bonus. Still, even with the extra defense, this mission is not easy, and I have to utilize my units very carefully, using cities to my advantage and setting up artillery walls to try and bait the enemy Neo Tanks into range. The AI of Dual Strike is a bit odd. Sometimes it charges in, other times it stays out of my range, and there doesn't seem to be a clear pattern to its behavior. I have to think that there's a little bit of RNG involved. Luckily, the Dual Strike AI is much less interested in going for kills and rather seeks to take value engagements, so it's quite easy to draw it in with the prospects of a good trade. As my first dual strike is ready, it could not come in at a better time, as I'm having to deal with a lot of scary units at once. And I'm hoping Von Bolt's Ex Machina will hit Cole's medium tank, but sadly it has other ideas and goes for his bomber in the back instead. Luckily, the Ex Machina is just a cherry on top. It's the double turn I'm interested in, as it allows me to move several artillery within range and fire on his neo tank on the same turn, which manages to take it down. 
At this point, I have to try and secure the base, but that thing can spawn some very scary units, so I have to put several artillery units within its range to try and lock it down, while also dealing with Cole constantly sending bombers my way, all within range of a mini cannon. Yeah, this mission made me sweat quite a bit. There's a lot of things that can go wrong here. In the end, I'm able to take the base, destroy the mini cannon, and take the southern airport. And at that point, I can start pumping out bombers, which is needed to take down Cole's main base as he keeps spamming Neo tanks, forcing me to retreat my entire northern force west. Luckily, once the bombers are out, it's only a matter of time before Cole is routed. And on day 29, with zero losses, I kill his last mech and earn myself an A rank. Feels bad, man. In Mission 6, The Ocean Blue, we get our first pre-deployed naval battle. We have to fight with submarines, cruisers, and battleships, but we also got some land units and some transports, with the objective being either routing the enemy or capturing the HQ on their island. Being a naval battle, you'd think Drake would be the perfect pick, but they made some changes to him in Dual Strike, and I really don't like them. Whereas before, his naval units would get extra movement and defense, in Dual Strike they only get 20% increased firepower, which is a very boring change. Now there's no reason to pick Drake for a battle like this, as there are other COs that just does naval combat better, like Kumbai, Von Bolt, or even Max. However, there is another CO that completely trivializes this battle, and that is Grit. With Grit, your rockets can no longer be zoned out by Lash battleships, which is what makes this fight tricky to begin with. Furthermore, your battleship can zone out hers, as long as you take care to guard your own battleship against the incoming sub, which you can do quite easily with your battlecopters, the rest of the map becomes completely trivial. You can even move your own rocket in range of Lash's battleship on the allied property, as it will win this engagement due to being constantly repaired. Once you've eliminated the naval threat, your battleship can just repeatedly shell Lash's units on the island until you win the mission. In Chapter 7, Fog Rolls In, we get introduced to our first Fog of War mission in the campaign. There's nothing special about this one, just a regular battle in the fog with the objective being either routing or capturing the opponent's HQ. Since this is a fog mission, I decide to go with the fog specialist, Sonya. My battle plan for this map is just to build up a lot of forces, using her extended vision range to keep my units safe, and then tag over to her father once I've built up a large enough army. This map is a bit weird in that Cole has a bunch of ships hidden in the reefs, but most of them are out of ammo, so you can kinda just ignore them, as he only has a single base to produce units, so you don't really have to deal with any APCs coming around to resupply them. I do fail this map once as I get ambushed from the fog, but after that it's fairly trivial to beat this map. I just have to capture the northern airport to prevent Cole from fielding battlecopters, and then swap over to Kumbai once my army starts to amass to a critical size. And then it's just a matter of waiting around for the battle standard to be ready. One of the strongest dual strikes in the game, with a 30% bonus to firepower. It's quite hilarious to see how powerful Kumbai becomes with this thing active. 90% extra firepower with a 30% lock modifier on top of that. Now that is scary. With the insanely overpowered battle standard, this mission ends up becoming a complete cakewalk. And on day 13, with no losses, I capture Cole's HQ to earn myself another easy victory. In Chapter 8, Tag Battle, we no longer get to gang up on the enemy, as they'll start tagging against us from here on out. This map also introduces us to the Pipe Runner, a brand new unit to dual strike that can only move on pipes, but otherwise works quite similarly to a rocket, except that it can attack air units. The positioning of this Pipe Runner makes it very annoying to go up against, as it's guarded by an artillery behind the pipes, so I'm just going to ignore it for as long as possible. Since the enemy can now use dual strikes against us, I have to bring in the duo of Colin and Sasha. Remember how I'd said you'd see a lot of these two? Well, get ready, because from here on out, disabling enemy dual strikes becomes a top priority. Despite once again being a regular route and capture mission, there are a few objectives I need to take care of. I have to prevent the enemy from capturing the central base, and this can be a bit tricky with Piperunner guarding it. I also have to capture the eastern airport so I can begin deploying bombers. 
Luckily, I can deploy Neo tanks in this mission, and with Colin's deployment reduction and Gold Rush, it's not hard to deploy several of them right away to ward against the enemy's aggression. Once I deal with the initial charging unit, this map becomes a rather slow but careful dance of building up money with Colin and popping Market Crash with Sasha at the last possible moment. And there's a few times where I cut it dangerously close. Once I have the Eastern Airport captured, I can deploy bombers every single turn, and at this point it's quite easy to eliminate the Pipe Runner and everything else around it. I do make a huge blunder on day 18 and leave one of my infantry in range of a Neo tank, which forces a reset, and that's mildly infuriating to say the least, but that's just part and parcel of doing a deathless challenge like this. On my second attempt, I've all but figured this map out, and it's very easy for me to beat it. I just have to watch the enemy power meter and deploy a bunch of bombers, which I can use to wreak absolute havoc on the enemy base. On day 20, with zero losses, I destroy the last unit to earn myself another victory. Chapter 9, Victory or Death, marks the ending of the first arc, and it is our very first dual screen battle, one of the many gimmicks introduced in Dual Strike. This effectively means that we are doing battle on two fronts. For this mission, we have one battle on the ground, while another one is in the air. The objective is to smash a Black Crystal, a unique structure that heals and resupplies enemies around it. But before we can reach it, we have to shoot down a Black Fortress in the sky on the secondary front by destroying all four of its mini cannons. Once we do this, the fortress will stop bombarding the base in the center, allowing us to utilize it. But I find that this base is kinda redundant anyway, at least with the strategy I'm gonna use. I pick Andy as my CO on the main front, and Eagle as my CO on the secondary front. Their abilities complement each other nicely, and they even have two tank stars and a unique dual strike to boot. This map introduces a new type of weather, sandstorms. During sandstorms, all indirect units have minus one range. I don't really plan on deploying a single indirect unit in this mission, so this won't really bother me at all. Here comes the frustrating bit though. You cannot directly control the units on the second front. The AI moves them for you, for whatever reason. But you do have the ability to choose the AI itself. If you select the Strike AI, the computer will stupidly rush all of its units headlong into the enemy range and lose a bunch of them, and even the general AI is prone to doing this from time to time. So it's imperative that you pick the defensive AI for at least the first turn, as that will cause the computer to place its units just outside of range. You can then change the AI to Strike next turn to go all in, and this is needed if you want the secondary front to progress smoothly. As I said at the start of this video, I can't be responsible for losses incurred while the AI controls the secondary front, but I'm still going to try and keep them to a minimum, and with this strategy it is actually doable to ensure the AI doesn't lose a single unit. This mission allows you to send your fighters and bombers up to the secondary front, and I do decide to send both of my fighters to assist Eagle, but I have to leave both my bombers on the main front. This will make sense later. So for now, all I need to do is to endure Cole's onslaught, and this is easier said than done. The most challenging part of this mission is surviving the first Trail of Woe, which comes in at a very bad time, with Cole assaulting you with a huge army. I get absolutely crushed the first time, as Cole just swoops in to destroy a bunch of my units with his increased movement and road bonuses. But on my second try, I manipulate his power meter so that he doesn't get Trail of Woe right before his units are about to hit me. Instead, I carefully attack him so that he's just shy of getting it, and then all I have to do is place my units carefully in such a way that Cole won't be able to kill them off, but instead just damage them severely. And this is why I picked Andy as my main CO. Hyper Upgrade comes in at the perfect time to repair all my damaged units, and the extra firepower and movement allows me to wipe the slate clean before Cole can even pop his power. At this point, Eagle is done mopping up the mini cannons, and once you win on the secondary front, your secondary CO will join your main one, allowing you to tag. Once this happens, any power that the secondary CO earned while fighting will be evenly distributed between the two tagging COs, which is why I almost have my dual strike ready, despite just having popped Hyper Upgrade. Due to Eagle's massive power bar though, it's not quite enough to get a dual strike right away, so I have to destroy a few units first, but it doesn't take me long to build it up. And then it's time to pop Andy and Eagle's unique dual strike, Airlift. This not only gives me 15% additional firepower, but it allows me to take a triple turn. This allows my bombers to quickly close the distance to the Black Crystal, and it ends up being completely overkill. I'm even able to destroy a few extra units for some power ranking. And on day 10, with zero losses, I smash the Black Crystal and clear the first arc of the campaign.
In Chapter 10, Black Boats Ahoy! We get introduced to a brand new naval unit in, you guessed it, the Black Boat. One of my favorite new additions to Dual Strike. These funny new naval units can transport two infantry units and are also able to repair one adjacent unit for one HP as well as resupplying them. And I think they are a very fun and creative unit. By far the best thing Dual Strike brought in. The gimmick of this map is that you have to try and destroy all the enemy black boats before they can repair the battleships. Kinda reminds me a little bit of the mission sinking feeling from Advanced Wars 2. You also have a special objective to protect your lander in this mission, but I never found that it was in any real danger anyway, as Kindle doesn't start out with any submarines. Speaking of Kindle, this is the first mission where we face her, and we'll be seeing a lot more of her from here on out. Kindle is a very annoying CO to go up against, as her units get a whooping 40% increased firepower whenever they're on properties, which hurts like hell. And her normal power, Urban Blight, might just be one of the most annoying powers in the game, dealing damage to all our units whenever they are situated on properties. So you constantly have to mind your positioning when going up against her, and it just kind of feels like she's cheating. Since this is a pre-deployed mission, however, I allow myself to cheat a little bit too, as I simply pick the power duo of Kumbai and Sonya. You can't really go wrong with 20% increased firepower and defense, as well as 15% extra luck damage. In fact, Kumbai and Sonya kinda trivialize this entire mission, as my units are just so much stronger than Kindles. I am able to blast my way through it without even thinking much about my positioning, and I even play so recklessly that when Kindle's first Urban Blight eventually rolls in, she has several opportunities to kill off my units, but luckily the Dual Strike AI doesn't really like going for kills and rather prefers taking value engagements, so Kindle instead opts to spread her damage out across my army, which is very convenient for me. As I capture one of the central properties, I suddenly remember that this map actually contains a secret mission which unlocks black boats for the player. And to my knowledge, there's no way to skip it once you've unlocked it, so I'm actually forced to beat it now. If I remember correctly, this map is pretty hard, so I may have made a big mistake, but eh, it'll probably be fine. Black boats might come in handy during this challenge, so I might as well get it over with. The rest of the mission is kind of a joke. I systematically sink the black boats one by one, and since Kindle's island is completely undefended with only a single artillery on it, I bring down a rocket and an infantry with my lander to clear the way rather than spending a lot of time chasing down Kindle's stray units. And on day 9, with no losses, I capture Kindle's HQ to earn myself a very easy victory and a smooth start to the first arc of the game. Mission 11, The Long March, is the first bonus level in the campaign, and we have to defeat it in order to unlock the Black Boat. I remember this mission as being one of the first roadblocks I encountered when trying to clear the Heart campaign for the first time. The objective is to route the enemy or capture the lab, which is located up in the northern section of the map, and to my knowledge this mission doesn't have a timer. However, you are facing an absolutely massive army and a whole ton of black boats which will run around and repair them constantly. This is the first mission where we get to control two teams of COs, and this is very good because it gives us a lot of flexibility. For the red team, I select Grit and Olaf. Grit is fantastic on this map since the red team starts out with a bunch of indirects, and this map pretty much plays like a defense mission where you have to try and shoot the enemy down before they can reach you, which is where Grit excels. For the blue team, I select Sasha and Colin. In any multi-team battle where you go up against enemy dual strikes, you want to select these two as your last team, as that allows Sasha to end the turn with a market crash. The reason why this is so important is because the AI is hard-coded to always activate its dual strike at the start of its turn. So it doesn't matter if Sasha's market crash just removes a single star, it will still delay the dual strike for a whole full turn and buy you valuable time. And that's all this mission is really about, buying enough time to the point where the enemy dual strike won't crush you. This mission is also all about knowing which targets to prioritize with your indirects. I ignore the enemy black boats as they are not important. Sasha submarines can deal with them later on anyway. Instead, I focus on the scary units like the neo tanks, the medium tanks and the enemy indirects whenever possible. It also helps to snipe enemy recons as the AI is dependent on vision in dual strike, so taking away that is actually a viable strategy. 
Building Power Charge with the blue team is also essential for this map. I play Sasha's Cruiser in range of the enemy rocket on day one so it takes damage, which allows me to activate my first market crash on day two. At this point, Sasha only has 9,000 in the bank, which barely removes little more than a single star from both enemy COs, but that still delays their dual strike by a full turn, which is all I need for now. I even avoid buying units with Sasha to let my money accumulate so that each consecutive market crash will be more potent. Meanwhile, Grit's mission is just to try and choke the point while dealing as much damage as possible. But I also have to deal with two incoming battlecopters from the north, though they are easily destroyed with my anti-air and missiles. There's also a neutral base which can be captured in this area, and I do try to get it, but I found that this actually isn't really needed for this map. Because by the time this base starts producing units, most of the battle is done anyway. At the end of day 3, Sasha has done so much damage that her market crash is available once again, and with 14,500 funds in the bank, this one is a little bit more effective. I take care to destroy as many enemies as I can before popping it, once again delaying the enemy dual strike for another crucial turn. At this point, the enemy forces are starting to reach grit, and I begin to sweat a little as I wonder how much longer I can keep the enemy dual strike at bay. Even though I've inflicted a considerable amount of damage, it still doesn't take much to make me lose a unit, especially with Jugger's insane luck damage. On day 5, the diminishing returns are starting to kick in hard, as Sasha's market crash is now 40% more expensive. But somehow, I am able to just squeeze out the last bit of power charge needed for Sasha to activate a third market crash, which I really didn't think I'd be able to do. This buys me yet another crucial turn to destroy as many of the enemy forces as possible. However, on day 6, I can no longer delay the inevitable, and the enemy finally gets to activate their unique dual strike, Power Surge. Luckily, at this point, I have dealt with most of the scary threats, and I even leave an undived sub close to the shoreline to draw the fire of the enemy tanks. This is a little scary, since Jugger's luck damage still allows him to inflict a lot of damage to it, and he actually does bring it down to 5 HP. But after this, I've successfully weathered the storm, and at this point, the rest of the map is just a formality. I move in to capture the lab, but I realize that I might just rout the enemy before I can do so. And sure enough, on day 12, with no losses, I take out the enemy's last artillery and score myself a victory. Man, that was a really fun map, and I'm sure the black boots will come in handy for the rest of the challenge too. In Mission 12, Lightning Strikes, we get introduced to one of the most popular COs in Advanced Wars. The guy who spawned literally hundreds of alt accounts on Advanced Wars by web. The madman himself, Lightning Grim. This guy is an absolute nightmare to go up against in this challenge because of his high firepower. All of his units deal 30% extra damage, but they also take 20% extra damage. Normally, this is considered quite bad, but in a Deathless challenge, I'd rather face Von Bolt than go up against this guy. However, in this mission, we face not only Grimm, but also Sensei, because this is a dual screen battle. Grimm is fighting us on the main front, while Sensei is fighting us on the secondary front. And this battle is also a nightmare, since you have a bunch of mechs in the center who are sitting ducks for Sensei's battlecopters. Luckily, you can turn the AI control off for the second front in this mission, allowing you to control it directly, which is nice, but that doesn't solve the problem. How the hell am I supposed to get all these mechs to safety before Sensei's battlecopters bear down on them? Picking Kumbai as the CO on the secondary front makes the most sense, as it's essentially a pre-deployed battle, so I pick Sonya as my CO for the main front, even though it's not a fog of war battle, and even though tag stars don't help during a split-screen battle. I just figured it'd be nice to get a battle standard dual strike when the COs eventually join up on the main front. But oh boy, when I went into this battle, I had no idea how tough it was about to get. The main front against Grimm is a challenge all by itself. I start with two anti-air on the main front, but I have to send them both to the second front immediately to have a chance of dealing with Sensei's Battlecopter Brigade. After I do that, I don't really have that much to defend against Grimm's initial forces, so I have to do what I can with what little I have. Here's the problem though. Even when I send both my anti-airs to the secondary front right away, I still don't have enough of them to prevent Sensei from picking off one of my units. There's simply too many of them. And I'm wondering if this is actually where I get softlocked. 
After all, like, what am I supposed to do? Conjure up additional anti-airs? I try a few more times, and I discover that the battle on the main front is just as bad. Due to not having any anti-airs at all, Grimm's initial battlecopter can harass me with impunity, and I even have to concede the base by the river as I don't have the units to defend it. I get slaughtered on the main front and on the secondary front. This is just terrible. After many frustrating restarts, I decide to change up my CO for the main front, as I'm severely lacking in funds, so I decide to give Colin a go instead. This actually proves to be very helpful, as it allows me to build an APC on turn 1, which I can send to the secondary front. This APC allows me to move the stray mechs into it to keep them safe from the incoming battlecopters. Meanwhile, because of Colin's deployment cost reduction, he's able to send more anti-airs to the secondary front, since they only cost 6,400 funds as opposed to 8,000, which really helps. This allows me to build a wall on the second front to protect myself against Sensei's incoming battlecopters. And just before his airborne assault is ready, I get to pop Samurai Spirit for a huge bonus to my defense. This proves to be so effective that Sensei's battlecopters don't even attack my units on his turn. And with that, I figured out how to solve the second front. But the main front is still a problem. Grim is bearing down on me with a huge army. I have to build a transport copter to get my infantry away from the north, but luckily I was able to capture the airport before that happened, which allows me to field battlecopters to harass Grimm's vehicles. However, they have a limited window of opportunity to be useful before Grimm's anti-air catches up to them, so I have to use them very effectively. As day 10 rolls in, I'm really starting to sweat as Grimm is bringing in anti-air and missiles to zone out my air units, which are the only things standing between him and four missile silos. If he reaches those silos, I am almost guaranteed to lose a unit. I therefore use my battlecopters to block the infantry, but Grimm's missiles and anti-air are getting ever closer. However, just when I think all is lost, Kumbai finally cleans up Sensei's last unit on the secondary front and joins Colin. This gives me an instant dual strike, and while these two CEOs don't have any special synergy bonuses, it still gives me a crucial double turn at the moment where I badly need it. Thanks to this dual strike, I am able to clean up a lot of Grimm's army and prevent him from reaching the missile silos, and I'm even able to transport a unit down with my T-copter to start capturing Grimm's base, while using the T-copter in the same turn to block his airport. On the next turn, I realize that I don't even need to finish capping the base, I can just rush his HQ instead, which is completely undefended. And on day 13, with zero losses, I finish capping to score myself a thunderous victory against Lightning Grim. This was easily the hardest and most frustrating mission of this challenge so far. In Mission 13, Frozen Fortress, we get introduced to... Ugh, hold on, what the hell is this awful sounding music? Give me a second, let me put on something better. Ah, there we go. Anyway, back to the game. This is a battle in the frozen wastelands of Blue Moon, and it is a two-on-one fight, with our enemy being in the center of this map. This mission can be an absolute nightmare if you don't tackle it correctly, and it also introduces you to a lot of new gimmicks, the first one being Com Towers. These structures gives all of your units 10% extra firepower as long as they remain under your control, and they stack. The enemy starts out with three of them already under their control, so beware of their firepower, it's going to be a lot higher than you think. The second gimmick this map introduces is weather, snow to be exact. Though it's a little bit weird, because the map may look snowy now, but that's actually just aesthetics. The real snow comes in on day 3. Since this map is all about comb towers and snow, I pick Javier and Kumbai as my red team, and Olaf and Grit as my blue team. The red team has two objectives here. The first is to capture all three comb towers to reduce the enemy firepower. The second is to capture this property over here to reveal the hidden lab map, which will unlock the Black Bomb secret mission. The blue team, on the other hand, has the most crucial job, and that is to prevent the enemy from capturing these two neutral bases. If they can pull that off, this mission becomes considerably easier. But it's not as simple as it seems, and units have to be moved very carefully. 
I start out as Javier on the red side so that I can buy units at regular price. Javier is a new CO introduced in Dual Strike, and he's all about comm towers, utilizing them much better than other COs. The funny thing about this mission is that he's not really going to utilize those powers. I selected him mostly for style points, and because he's got a tank star with come by for some reason. I do swap over to come by as soon as the fighting begins, as the 20% extra defense is sorely needed. Each of my units needs to be moved very carefully, as one misstep usually means a reset. Keep in mind, I'm up against an enemy with 30% extra firepower. It's basically like I'm fighting Grim, but without the reduced defense. While all that's going on, I use my starting Antire on the blue side to harass the enemy capturing infantry, making sure they don't get the bases. I have to be careful to move around the enemy medium tanks, but luckily for me, they have the guard AI, meaning they stand still until something comes within their range. So if I take care to move around them, they won't pose any problems for the duration of the entire mission. At the start of day 3, the snow kicks in, and it will remain for the rest of the map. Snow has been changed quite considerably in Dual Strike, no longer reducing movement, but instead doubling fuel consumption, which is pretty laughable. However, due to these changes, Olaf has been changed considerably as well. He now gets 20% extra firepower in the snow. This combined with the extra luck he gets from Grit's tank star allows him to deal a lot of damage, letting me bring the enemy mech down to 1 HP. And for some strange reason, during the next turn, the AI decides to suicide that mech on my anti-air, which means that the enemy now only has a single 3 HP infantry left capping the base. At this point, I just have to deal with a single tank and the two battlecopters, which can be easily baited into the range of my other units. Once I do that, the map becomes an absolute joke, as the enemy can no longer deploy units. The medium tanks will just stand around and pick their noses, and whatever enemy units are left alive will have a lot of their bite reduced after I finish capping all the enemy contacts. Towers. At this point, I just have to move one infantry over to the northeastern city to get the map, and then another infantry over to the HQ in the center to start capturing it. Before I get the lab map, I make sure to save the game in a different slot in case it turns out the mission is impossible to do deathless. It's not like I can skip it, so I'd need to go back here if it turns out to be the case. And then, on day 10, with no losses, I finish capping the HQ to earn myself a chilling victory. Mission 14, Lash's Test, is where we unlock some brand new black hole tech. We begin with a large pre-deployed army, and the objective is to break out the player-controlled black bombs that are trapped inside the pipe seams. Now, why do we control those bombs? Because Lash lost her remote control, and we were able to find it. Yes, that is the actual story of this mission. Immediately upon seeing these black bombs, my heart sinks a little, because I realize that this mission might be impossible to do deathless. The black bombs are pretty essential here, since Lash has a much larger army than we do, and the black bombs are needed to cut it down a peg. But I have an even bigger issue. I need to test if blowing up one of your own black bombs counts as a loss. And to my great relief, it does not. This means that I am free to use black bombs as much as I want. Yes, technically, they do blow themselves up, which means I am losing a unit, but the game doesn't register it as a loss, so I couldn't care less. The tricky part about this mission is freeing the four black bombs on the right side of the map. We only start with a single battlecopter to attack the pipe seam, and Lash has a cruiser nearby. I would guess that the point of this mission is to get one of your rockets close enough to this beach right here, and use it to blast the pipe from there. But there's a much better way to cheese this mission, and that's to simply pick Grit as your main CO. Thanks to his extended attack range, it's possible to blast open the pipe seam from our starting position, turning this mission into an absolute joke. To make it even more laughable, I pick Javier as my second CO, since there are two com towers near our starting position. My game plan is quite simple. I used the two black bombs on the left side to blast the initial group of enemies, preventing the infantry from capping the airport, and then I play as Grit until I've blown up on the right-hand pipe seam and captured the two com towers. Once I've done that, I swap over to Javier, who now has 20% increased day-to-day -day defense. However, I don't blow up my bombs right away. I use one of them to weaken the cruiser so it won't shoot down my bombs, and then on the following turn, I charge in with everything I have to fill up my power bar. 
Once my superpower is ready, I activate Javier's Tower of Power, which triples the effect of my Com Towers. This effectively means I now have six of them, which translates into 70% increased defense thanks to the passive power boosts. I end the turn blowing up the remaining three bombs to target Lasha's scary units, and then I just press wait. Lash activates her superpower on the next turn, but she doesn't inflict a single point of damage to me. Defense stacking is just completely broken in this game. After this turn is over, I still have some cleaning up to do, but it's a fairly simple task. I even get to activate my normal power one more time to give me immunity to Lash's indirects. And once I've cleaned up almost every last unit on the map on day 10, with no losses, I capture the lab to seize the Black Bomb schematics for myself. Mission 15, Verdant Hills, is our first forte into the lands of Green Earth, and waiting to greet us is the duo of Jess and Javier. This map is a bit strange. It's a defense mission, but it's also on a timer, so we have to win it in 15 days. Javier and Jess have a huge army coming towards us, and it has to go through a tiny choke point, and our job is to blast them to bits with our indirects, because that's just how friends get to know each other in the Advanced Wars universe. In total, there are five Com Towers on this map. Two of them start under the enemy's control, and another one will be captured by them shortly after the battle begins. The last two Com Towers are neutral. If you paid any attention to the last map, you'll know just how devastating this makes Javier, and we have to try and get these from him as soon as possible. For the red team, I select the CO's Grim and Kumbai. For the first few turns, I just need as much firepower as possible so my recons can take out the stray infantry. And Kambai will be useful for later when I have to choke the point. For the blue team, I select Grit and Max. Max is just here to give two tag stars to his buddy. Grit will be doing most of the work here. In theory, it is possible to select Sasha and Colin to try and delay the enemy dual strikes, but this is very hard to pull off since the blue team hardly has any income. Besides, Grid is just so much more fun to use on a map like this. I start the turn out with red team trying to hunt down as many infantry as I can. You really cannot let these guys reach the neutral airport or bases, otherwise you're in for a heap of trouble. Meanwhile, down in the south, I actually decide to hold my fire, and I don't even attack Javier with a single one of my indirects. There are multiple reasons for why I decide to do this. The first one is that Javier starts out with two Com Towers under his control, and his passive indirect defense on top of that means I hardly do much damage to him to begin with. However, secondly, and maybe most important of all, this means that Javier tags over to Jess on the following turn without having that big a power bar. This will allow me to give Jess a good shellacking with my indirects without risking charging her power meter all the way up to a dual strike. Instead, I leave their power meter just barely short of one, as again, the AI is hard-coded to always activate dual strikes at the start of the turn. By manipulating the enemy power meter in this way, I ensure that Javier will be the one leading the dual strike, and this means that Jess will be going last. This is incredibly important, because it means I won't have to deal with a full turn of Javier's troops taking no damage. Meanwhile, at this point, I'm done clearing out most of the infantry in the north with Grim, so I then proceed to tag in Kumbai and place a medium tank on the property situated directly over the choke point. Even with Kumbai's increased defenses though, his medium tank is not guaranteed to survive an enemy dual strike. So I take care to focus fire the dangerous units with grit, such as the enemy medium, neo, and mega tanks. Speaking of mega tanks, this is the first mission where we see them deployed. They are essentially just very slow and very dangerous frontline units. I made an entire video dedicated to analyzing these units on my channel, and it has gotten quite a lot of views. If you want to check it out later, I'll throw a link to it up on the screen. Anyway, at this point, I have done all I can to prepare for the coming storm. Javier and Jess finally activate their unique dual strike, Green Flash, which adds another 10% firepower on top of their already massive damage. And there's little I can do now other than just picking a god and praying. Choking the point with my medium tank proves easy enough, as the AI really struggles with its move order. But sadly, the enemy mechs storm across the mountains, and thanks to their double turn, they're able to pick off one of my artillery, forcing a reset. I realized that if I want any chance at succeeding this mission, I have to focus fire the mechs first. This was also the case in the Advanced Wars 2 mission, Tanks, which plays very similarly to this one. 
Mechs are just much more dangerous than anything else on this map because they can actually move over the mountains and target your squishy units, so they must be prioritized even over enemy neotanks. On my next try, I do exactly that, picking off most of the mechs before they can even pose a threat to me. I also decide to hold my fire for one additional turn against Javier so that I can capture two of his comm towers before the dual strike comes in. He still has a single tower in the middle that I can't get to, but this takes a big bite out of his firepower and defense, and is extremely helpful. A mega tank does eventually make its way up to the choke point, and it takes a big bite out of my medium tank, bringing it down to 2 HP. This makes me sweat a little, but on the next turn I'm able to shell it with some artillery fire, taking away most of its damage potential, to the point where I can just use my recons to tank it. At this point, most of the enemy infantry is gone, and I just have to deal with the vehicles. But due to the insane amount of damage I'm inflicting on them, Javier and Jess almost have a second dual strike ready again, so I have to stall for a few turns without inflicting damage until I can afford a Neo tank as come by and put it on the city as I'm much more confident it will hold out against the enemy mega tanks. As the second green flash rolls in, I grit my teeth and hope I won't get blasted to bits, and miraculously, I survive the turn. Now, the enemy numbers have dwindled to the point where I can actually charge into the valley and start picking off stragglers. But just to speed things up a bit, considering I am on a timer after all, I move one of my mechs towards the enemy HQ, and on day 12, with zero losses, I capture it to score myself a victory. As Javier would say, that was some glorious Heinz-spanking. Mission 16, Snow Hunters, is one of the first big roadblocks in the Dual Strike Hard campaign. I remember being stuck on this mission for a long time on my first playthrough as a teenager. The reason why this map is so difficult is because you're essentially on a timer. You have to destroy three mini cannons before Hawk's massive army can catch up with you. But he also has quite a few units between you and those cannons, including medium tanks, battlecopters, bombers, and artillery. So it's all about pushing ahead right into the lion's maw. Hulk also has two pipe runners, which will start chasing down your units, but I found that they are pretty much a non issue on this map since you start with a battleship capable of zoning them out. Speaking of Hawk, this is the first mission where we have to fight him. He's unchanged from the last game, with his high firepower and global damage. But despite the dual strike power creep, he's still a terrifying CO to go up against. There is a lab map on this little island down in the southeast, which unlocks the Pipe Runner secret mission. I'm going to gun for it, as most of these missions have been pretty easy so far, I just hope I won't end up regretting it. For my choice of COs, I'm once again gonna go with the trusted duo of Sonya and Kambai. They are just too good on a pre-deployed mission like this. However, I actually start playing as Sonya, as I need to build her power meter a little bit so I can make sure I get a dual strike later on. I even put one of my submarines in range of Hawk's artillery to get a damage for an extra bit of power charge, since the sub is pretty much useless for this mission anyway. Hawk does have a battleship, but it's stationary, so I just have to stay out of its attack range. I start working on the pipe seams immediately, with the intent of breaking them down as fast as I can. After I built up nearly two stars as Sonya, I tag over to Kambai and prepare to face the coming storm. I use the pipe seam to my advantage to bottle Hawk's unit up in a giant clump so I can hit them all with a really juicy missile, and then I start smashing through his units. Charging in, I do place a lot of my units in range of the enemy mini cannons, which seems suicidal, but I do this for a reason. I don't want Hawk's units to run away for repairs, so I present them with some juicy damage targets so that they'll stick around. It may look like I'm taking too much damage, but my dual strike is right around the corner, and once I activate the incredibly powerful battle standard, it's quite easy for me to clean up the remainder of Hawk's units, leaving the mini cannons wide open. During this time, I've used a single cruiser to block Hawk's naval units down in the south, and meanwhile over on the island, I've successfully captured the property with a lab map in it. One of the pipe runners have actually moved into the blind spot of my battleship, but thanks to the double turn afforded by my dual strike, I'm able to move and fire, eliminating it in the same turn. The mission isn't quite over yet, however. Hawk finally activates his Black Storm, dealing damage to every single unit I have. With all of my units being damaged, it takes a lot longer to destroy the cannons than I had anticipated. And I even start sweating a bit as my cruiser is brought dangerously low. Cruisers can attack other cruisers in dual strike. They don't do a lot of damage, but they can still whittle them down given enough time, so I have to retreat it and block it off with a lander, without even knowing where Hawk's submarine is at. 
Luckily, it isn't close enough to shoot it down, so it survives another turn. But I realize that if I don't destroy the mini cannons today, I will have to reset due to losing one of my naval units. So I attack the remaining cannons with everything I have and just barely manage to take them down. On day six, with no losses, the last cannon falls, allowing me to claim my victory. Man, even when I cheese this map, it still proves to be pretty hard. No wonder I struggled so much as a teenager. Mission 17, Spiral Garden, is a real tough cookie to crack. This is the map we have to beat to unlock pipe runners, and we're facing four of them right off the bat. The objective is to capture 15 properties before Kindle, but we can also win by capturing her lab or routing her. Not surprisingly, this mission has a lot of pipe seams, and Kindle also starts out with a huge ground army. For this mission, I select the duo of Cole and Adder. This is going to get really tough really fast, and I need a dual strike as early as possible to avoid losing any units. And these two have the fastest one in the entire game. I begin this mission by blasting the pipe seams with everything I have, even my tanks and anti-air. It's crucial to destroy as many of them as possible early on. Not only will this allow you to advance through them, but it also cuts off the mobility of the enemy pipe runners, who will reach your base a lot faster than you think. Already on day 4, Kindle is inside my base with pipe runners and a neo tank. The rocket I built early on to try and zone out the enemy units isn't doing much, as the enemy pipe runners can just dart within its minimum range. On day 5, Kindle pops her first urban blight and starts grinding my units down. Sadly, my dual strike is still nowhere near ready, and I just don't have a good response to this attack. Kindle's pipe runners are surrounding me on all sides, preventing my mobility, and by day 7, she snipes one of my units, forcing a reset. On my next try, I decide to try out a different strategy. I need something that can take on both Kindle's Neo Tank and survive a few hits from our pipe runners. And to my knowledge, there's only one unit that can fill that role, and that is the Mega Tank. I can't quite afford one in time, so I have to combine two of my own injured tanks together to get one out in time to block the choke point leading into my base. But Kindle pops her power and rolls max lock with her Neo Tank, bringing my Mega Tank's HP down from 8 to 3. Yeah, in case you don't know this, everyone's passive luck in Dual Strike has been increased from 10 to 15%, which is something I really don't like. It just means units die too fast in this game. On my third try, I discover something pretty cool. Kindle is coded to nearly always prioritize her normal power if it is ready, because Urban Blight is just that good. However, she won't activate it if you don't have any units on cities. So what I do is simple. On the turn Kindle has her Urban Blight ready, I just base skip, and then I move all my units off properties, which means Kindle won't activate it that turn. Since her superpower is only 6 stars, this allows me to charge it all the way up on the next turn. And while Kindle prefers spamming her Urban Blight if she is able to, the Dual Strike AI is hardcoded to always activate its superpower if it is ready. This is important because it means Kindle is forced to use her shitty High Society instead. This power is generally seen as a complete waste. It increases firepower by 3% per property Kindle has captured. This sounds nice on paper, as it can snowball pretty hard, but 3% isn't a very big number, and there usually aren't enough properties on a map to make it viable. This allows me to easily survive the turn and follow it up with a dual strike. Colon Adder actually has a unique one called Creepy Crawly, which gives 10% extra firepower. But more importantly, I get a double turn, with plus 2 movement on both of them. This is important because it allows my tanks to reach those elusive pipe runners and take them out. Once the pipe runners are gone, the rest of the mission becomes laughably easy. But instead of going the slow route by capturing 15 properties, I decide to use a strategy that I was able to devise many years ago as a teenager. It involves bringing in artillery, and infantry, and another ground vehicle up to the pipe seam close to Kindle's base. You see, Kindle has a unique AI in this mission that prevents her from destroying any pipe seams, as that would reduce the mobility of her own pipe runners. As a result, the seam leading into her base is still intact. All I need to do is charge up another dual strike, which doesn't take long, with my infantry positioned right next to the pipe. This allows me to activate another creepy crawly, blast open the pipe seam, move my infantry to start capturing Kindle's lab, and then swap over to get another turn. On day 19, with zero losses, I capture the lab on the same day and earn myself a victory, alongside some brand new pipe runner schematics.
Mission 18, Omens and Signs, is another split-screen map. On the main front, we have a naval battle, where the objective is to destroy the four mini-cannons surrounding a sea fortress. But any attacks we try to make against those cannons will only do 1% damage until we beat the secondary front in the skies. This is sadly another AI-controlled front, and there's no way to avoid casualties this time. There are simply too many fighters on both sides, and the enemy has black bombs again, so I just have to ignore it. This mission introduces us to two new units. The first one is the Carrier. I made an analysis video on it on my channel in case you want to check it out, but in short, it's a naval unit that attacks air units from a distance and can carry two plane units. They're kinda trash, but they will be useful for this mission. Inside the carriers, we have the second brand new unit, the Stealth Fighter. This is an air unit that can attack both air and ground units, but it can also hide itself like a submarine. It's pretty reviled in the competitive community and banned from almost every single match, but they are kind of fun occasionally. For a mission like this, which involves a battle at sea and another in the air, there's no better team than Drake and Eagle. You may think these two have poor synergy since they're both weak at what the other CO specializes in, but they have two tank stars with another and a very strong unique dual strike. I do find myself really missing Drake's extra boat movement and improved defense, but his 20% extra firepower is pretty nice for this mission. And Drake's air units are a lot stronger in dual strike. He only gets a 10% firepower penalty now, as opposed to the 30% he used to get in Advanced Wars 2. In this mission, the CO on the main front has a single objective, and that is to free the stealth fighters trapped inside the carriers who are being harassed by some cruisers. Strictly speaking, you only need to free the three stealths close to your starting position. There are four more trapped in a pipe seam to the east, but I never found that they were super useful for this mission. When I play this map, I avoid sending aircraft to the second front. They are much more useful on the main one to ward away Jugger's aircraft and to help both trap enemy units, fight naval threats, and blast open pipe seams. Later on, I will send a single fighter to help expedite the process of clearing the second front, but this isn't actually needed. The fighters Eagles start out with will win eventually. This map is far from simple, though. There's a lot of things to keep track of, and each turn takes a very long while to go through due to all the enemy ranges I have to constantly monitor. I really wish they had implemented a way to check global ranges in this game like you can do in some of the newer Fire Emblem games. It would have saved me so much time. Aside from breaking out the stealth fighters, the main CO is really just stalling for time until the second CO can win, paving the road for the eventual game-ending dual strike. Once I break a few stealth fighters out, things get a lot easier for me as the only unit capable of threatening them are enemy fighters, and Dragor only has a single one at his disposal on the main front. However, another thing about this map which is incredibly useful is that once you've freed all your stealth fighters, you can join your damaged carriers together to get an absolutely absurd amount of cash back. Each carrier is worth 30,000, and when you join them together, you get the surplus funds added directly to your income, so you can easily afford to buy a bunch of battleships from this money alone. As day 4 rolls in, my Typhoon is ready, and I activate it right away, since I know I'll get a ton of power charge when Eagle rejoins the main front. However, I forget that in Dual Strike, Typhoon causes Fog of War for a turn, which is both good and bad. Good because the AI actually has to rely on Vision to do something in Dual Strike, but also bad because while Drake doesn't get reduced movement in the rain, he still gets reduced Vision, meaning he's kinda blind for a turn. It doesn't end up being a huge issue for me though, as again, all I'm doing on the main front is just stalling for time. As Eagle wraps things up on the secondary front, I perform the oopsie of a century, as right after that, my stealth fighter crashes due to running out of fuel. I did monitor its fuel reserves on the turn before, and I even had a black boat within supplying range, but I was under the impression that stealth fighters burned 5 fuel per turn while stealthed, but in actuality they burned 5 extra fuel when stealthed. As a competitive Advanced Wars by web player, I am a bit ashamed that I didn't already know this, but to my defense, stealth fighters are banned from 90% of all competitive maps on the Global League. However, when checking the status screen to see if Dual Strike treats a crashed unit as lost, which it does by the way, I discover something absolutely amazing. Units destroyed on the secondary front are not treated as losts. This makes me very happy, as it means I don't have to bother trying to manipulate the AI to keep losses to a minimum. So while I do have to reset due to the crash stealth fighter, I now know that I can completely ignore any future secondary fronts. Man, that would have been very nice to know during mission 12. 
On my second try, I've all but figured this map out, and it becomes pretty easy once you understand you're not really in any danger. You can just put your units up in a defensive formation and wait for the secondary CO to clean up. But because I'm bored, I still decide to wipe out a bunch of Jugger's units, and I'm actually able to destroy most of them on the map before Eagle finishes up. In fact, I don't really need the dual strike at all. I can just destroy the Mimic Cannons regularly. But I kind of want to show it off. It looks pretty badass after all, and it has a really cool name. Stormwatch. I activate it and destroy the remaining mini cannons. One, two, and three. I actually get a bit ahead of myself and forget to show the unit's lost tab for the camera, but luckily Dual Strike also shows this on the post-battle report. As you can see, I clear the mission in 13 days with no losses. Mission 19, Into the Woods, is one of the most punishing chapters in the entire campaign. This is a pre-deployed fog of war battle where we control two armies against the tank team of Lash and Kindle. This map is difficult for multiple reasons. The fog makes it hard to advance and the map is covered in woods on the south side. You're also up against the tank team, which means a single dual strike going off is an instant reset. And this map also introduces you to maybe one of dual strike's dumbest new units, the Uzium. This giant blob of jelly moves one space per turn and will instantly kill any unit it touches. They are relatively easy to avoid most of the time, but if you're not careful, you can run into one of them in the woods and get one of your units trapped, which results in them getting eaten next turn. And I very much think this is by design. Usium are weird units. They hardly take damage from indirect fire, and vehicles don't dent them much either, but infantry and anti-air does decently against them for some reason. On hard mode, this map has four Uzium in total, but only the first two pose any real threat to your army. The other two arrive too late to be consequential. For a difficult map such as this one, I don't have much of a choice when it comes to my CO selection. For the red team, I have to pick Kambai and Sonya. They're just too damn good here. And Sonya's scouting powers will actually be immensely useful, considering how heavily forested the south side of the map is. For the blue team, I have no choice but to once again go with the power duo of Sasha and Colin. I told you guys you would see a lot of them in this video. As I mentioned earlier, if the enemy is allowed to get even a single dual strike, it's an instant reset, so Sasha's market crash is a must here. As I start my first try, I decide to check out if I can stall out this map by camping my starting position, letting the enemy come to me. After all, there is no time requirement for this mission. The objective is to route or to cap their HQ, so in theory I might just be able to stand my ground. There is a capturable airport and some missile silos to the east, which will be taken by the enemy eventually, but I figure it's safer to play it slowly rather than rush headfirst into my doom. But it turns out that standing still is an even worse idea. I get absolutely crushed. Kindle and Lash starts with a huge army on hard mode, and they completely overwhelm the blue team. I realize that stalling is not going to work, at least not on the north side. On my second try, I move the blue team towards the bridges, which acts as natural choke points, but on the hard mode version of this map, there's a stationary mega tank that zones out this section of the map, making it very hard to set up a defensive formation there. There is a solitary forest tile which can be choked, but it's dangerous to put a unit here as it might get scouted out by enemy battlecopters, so you have to take care to shoot them down at once. Still, I have no choice but to set up a defensive wall formation here and hope for the best. The enemy has too many tanks and I can't tank them all, so I have to bottle them up in the choke point. Meanwhile, down in the south, red team is inching slowly towards the middle, but even with Kambai's improved defenses, I have to be super careful as there's a lot of enemy units there. I also have to stay far away from the woods as there's two Usium there coming towards me. Getting trapped in the forest is a death sentence as you need two to three units to surround an Usium to kill it. This map is ridiculously hard, easily the most challenging map of this entire run. I fail maybe five or six times before I figure out a solid opening strategy. But even then, every move I make risks a reset. Every unit must be placed with extreme caution as there are just so many dangerous threats in the fog. The enemy not only has vehicles, battlecopters and Usium, but also a lot of indirects hidden everywhere. It almost feels like a grit mission from the advanced campaign of Advanced Wars 1. Even though things seem very dangerous down in the south, the blue team in the north has by far the hardest job, as I have to make sure Sasha has a market crash ready at the end of every turn. And there are several failed attempts where I end up doing a bit too much damage with red team while failing to build up adequate power charge with the blue team, resulting in an enemy dual strike and thus a reset. Luckily, every time Sasha activates market crash, it gets a little bit stronger due to my funds building up, as there's no basis to deploy units on this map. 
After countless frustrating resets, I finally get a try where things seem to go my way. On day 6, I finally built up enough power charge for the almighty battle standard. And what a joy it is to activate it. I'm practically able to wipe every single unit off the map on the south side, leaving only the north side as a contested area. It's pretty dicey up there, and the enemy comes dangerously close to getting their dual strike, but luckily, Sasha continues to keep their power meter down with her market crash, and Colin helps out too by popping the occasional gold rush to make it even more potent. When my final market crash goes off, I have 51,000 funds banked up with Sasha, which is enough to eliminate the enemy's entire power bar. At this point, the rest of the map becomes a formality, as I just have to hunt down the remaining units. And on day 10, with zero losses, I blast the final Neo tank to earn myself a victory. My goodness, what an incredibly challenging map. Mission 20, Muckamuck, is one of the wildest chapters in Dual Strike, and one of my personal favorites in the campaign. Here we face a total of 22 Uzium in a complete slugfest. There are some other units here too controlled by Cole, and I must admit, the first time I saw him in this mission, I was a little scared that his movement powers would make the Uzium faster. But luckily, they are completely unaffected by most CO powers, both good and bad. This is a mission all about dealing damage, and there are many ways you can tackle it. But I've always favored the duo of Jake and Jess. Jake is fantastic on this map, as it's almost completely covered in planes, and he also has a tag star with Jess, alongside a unique dual strike, which is very powerful and very fast to charge up. You do also control the blue team on this map, but they only start with a single rocket and an APC, which are supposed to represent Hawk and Lash fleeing from the Usium. Hilariously enough, losing them doesn't result in a game over, which seems like a huge oversight. I have to keep them alive, of course, as I can't allow any units to die, so I pick Grid just to boost the firepower and range of the solitary rocket that I do have. But in reality, you can pick anyone you want here, it doesn't really matter. At first, this map can seem rather daunting due to the sheer amount of Usium you have to deal with at once. But once you realize that all you need to do is to not end a unit's turn adjacent to one of them, you're fine, since they only move one tile. Most of the time, if you gang up on an Usium with three units, it will be destroyed. It can get a little dicey sometimes if you allow them to group up in the center, and I do actually make a mistake and leave one of my units next to one. Luckily, my dual strike is ready, so I activate it at the end of my turn to correct my mistake. Jake and Jess's heavy metal is a very strong dual strike, as both of them get a huge firepower increase and two movement on all their vehicles. And due to this, the map proves to be no challenge at all. As the Usium starts falling, the map gets progressively easier, and by the time the second heavy metal comes in, I clean up practically every single unit on the map. On day 9, with zero losses, I destroy the last clump of jello to earn myself a victory and an absolute crap ton of experience. Yeah, this is the map you want to reach if you want to rank up your COs in Dual Strike, by the way, as killing this many Usium will result in a lot of bonus points. Just look at the amount of ranks I get from this mission alone. It's pretty crazy. Not that I need it though, I've maxed out every single CO in the game. Mission 21, Healing Touch, is an absolute banger and another one of my favorites in the campaign. This is a pre-deployed battle where every single enemy unit on the map starts with 2 HP, and your objective is to destroy the 6 obelisks on the map as quickly as you can before they can repair the enemy units. This requires you to play hyper-aggressive, which is what makes this map so fun. You once again get control of two teams, and for the primary red team, I'm going with the creepy crawlies, Cole and Adder, as I need a fast dual strike to wrap this mission up. For the blueies, it's once again going to be Sasha and Colin. No enemy dual strikes or fun allowed here. My objective for the first turn is to destroy three of the six obelisks, cutting the enemy's repairs in half. I also need to secure the two missile silos in the south. There are three more of them locked behind a pipe, but they are guarded by a medium tank, so I tend to ignore them. One thing that is a little annoying about this map is that you have to fight during a sandstorm, which reduces the range of all your indirects, but that's just something you have to plan around. The first enemy turn is wild. For some reason, Kindle and Jugger has a very strange AI on this map where they will repeatedly smash their own units into yours, which is strange considering they should try to keep their units alive so they can be repaired. But hey, I'm not complaining. 
It's also a very good thing that the enemy likes to group around the obelisks, as this allows my missiles to deal massive damage. The enemy does build up their power meter pretty quickly, but as with the other missions, Sasha's Market Crash is an absolute lifesaver here, despite the fact that I almost have no money to work with. After the three initial obelisks are gone, my next target becomes the one in the middle. I need to be careful as the enemy units in the north are starting to be repaired up now, and the enemy still has a lot of comm towers under their control. Luckily, my creepy crawly is ready, and with it, I'm able to just bum rush the obelisks down. The sandstorm also dissipates on day 4, which is nice, as it allows me to bring my rocket in to help. There's a lot of roads on this map surrounding the obelisks, which is very nice for Cole, as he gets a nice little boost when standing on them. Thanks to the quick dual strike, the obelisks stand no chance, and as early as day 4, I smash the final one to earn myself a swift victory. Mission 22, Crystal Calamity, is the final map of the penultimate arc. In this chapter, we have to destroy a Black Obelisk, a giant structure in the center of the map which restores 5 HP to all enemy units at the start of each turn. However, in order to render it vulnerable, we need to activate 9 missile silos spread all around the map. Moving an infantry unit over them will launch a missile at a satellite, and once all 9 have been fired, we can start targeting the obelisk directly. But if the enemy reaches even a single one of these missile silos with an infantry unit before we do, we get an instant game over. This is another one of those real timed missions, as we have 50 minutes to win. But this is far more than you'll ever need, and you can completely ignore it. Despite that, this is maybe the most challenging mission in the Dual Strike campaign. And I remember resetting on it countless times on my first playthrough. Luckily, we get to control three teams at once against the enemy. And for the red team down in the south, I pick the team of Rachel and Nell. I'll be needing a lot of luck damage to deal with some of the units on their side. For the blue team in the northwest, I pick Grit and Max. The blue team is mostly delegated to using indirect units like artillery and battleship, so Grit is the MVP here. For the green team on the east side, I'll have to pick Sasha and Colin once again to prevent enemy dual strikes. Each team on the map has their own designated tasks for this mission. Each of them have three nearby missile silos that they have to secure, but they also have to deal with various threats coming their way. The red team has to deal with a very early mega tank, and the reason I picked Nell and Rachel is because luck is the best way to get rid of it. Artillery deals very poor damage to it, but with this insane pairing, I have a total luck rating of 35%, so if I'm a little lucky with my rolls, I can get rid of it easily enough. Aside from that, Nell and Rachel just has to build a lot of rockets, and use them to harass the eastern base and the units around the obelisk. Once all 9 missiles have been launched, it's the red team who will storm the obelisk head on with their dual strike. The blue team in the west also has some missile silos to secure, one on an island and two in the south. Grit's primary objective is to prevent any infantry units from passing through the narrow canal to reach those silos, and once he gets a few battleships out, I can use them to destroy the northern black cannon, which frees up a big area for the green team to move around. Speaking of the green team, they have by far the most crucial job here. The three eastern missile silos are very exposed, and the enemy infantry units are threatening to secure them from both the north and the south. Furthermore, they also have to deal with an early game stealth fighter. It is very tough to get enough money out for a fighter to counter it, but by spending two days as Sasha for the extra income, and then swapping over to Colin on day three to get the reduction, allows me to get one out in time to deal with it. After handling the enemy's initial charging units, this map becomes strangely passive. Even though I'm controlling three different teams, income is very low across the board, so it's really all about just slowly building up units until I can start pushing outwards. The only team that needs to actively participate in combat is Sasha and Colin. I have to continually send out bombers and fighters and get them damaged by Antire to keep charging up Sasha's market crash, because as with all the other missions, a single enemy dual strike means an instant reset. This becomes more and more difficult as time progresses, but I'm just barely able to squeeze them out, though there are a few times where I cut it dangerously close. The missiles by the red team are the first to get captured. They are pretty close to Nell and Rachel's starting position and aren't in any real danger of being taken due to being protected by the pipe scene. After that, I secure the missile silos on the east side with the green team, which is also pretty easy to do. The last two missile silos are by far the hardest to reach, because the enemy sends a lot of scary troops down there to intercept me, along with some Usium, which are not easy for Grit to deal with due to their resistance to indirect fire. 
but after getting two battleships into position, it's easy for me to blast away all the other units as I secure the missile silos, rendering the Black Obelisk vulnerable. At this point, Nell and Rachel's dual strike is ready, and I activate Windfall, which gives me a whopping 30% extra bonus to firepower, but it also sets Nell's luck rating to a hilarious 115%, which is pretty damn insane. I then blast open the pipe seam leading into the obelisk's location with my rockets, and on day 16 with zero losses, I use a weakened neotank to smash the remaining obelisk and claim my victory. Sadly, I only get a B rank due to how passively I was forced to play this mission, but it's not like the rankings matter anyway. Mission 23, Dark Ambition, is the beginning of the final arc of Dual Strike, and this is where things start to get really challenging. This is a pre-deployed map where we control three teams against a huge enemy army who has to blast its way through some pipe seams to get at us. But despite playing like a defense mission, this is just a regular route or capture the enemy HQ map, which I find a little odd. This is the part of the campaign where we start going up against the cloned Macrolancios, the dumbest plotline from the first game resurrected. And up first, we have to battle Clone Olaf. This is a bit annoying as this map is fought in constant snow and we also have to deal with global damage, which I'm not a fan of. There is a way to turn off the snow by capturing one of the properties on the map, but I never bothered doing this. For the red team, I select Grit and Max as they start off with a lot of indirects. For the blue team, I select only Olaf. There's no other CO in the game which gives him tag stars aside from Grit and there's no way he'll ever get a dual strike, so there's simply no point in selecting a partner. For the green team, I have to pick Sasha and Colin again. You, you know the drill by now. I don't need to explain it. The first thing I need to do in this mission is to retreat the hell away from the pipe seams. The enemy will spend valuable time breaking them open with their weaker units like tanks and anti-air, giving me some valuable time to set up my indirects. But there's another reason I have to stall for time, and that's because the enemy starts out with a black bomb. Going head first into that thing will make this mission impossible, so we need to make it crash before we can engage the enemy. By moving my battleship close to the pipeline, I can manipulate the black bomb into moving towards it, and I need to do this while Kindle is the main CO. This is because in the snow, the black bomb expends two fuel per movement, meaning a full move drains it of 16 fuel. By forcing it to move back again, that's a total of 32 fuel lost, and considering it burns 5 fuel per day just to stay afloat, this means I can make it crash on day 4 by making it expend its last movement. Once the black bomb is dealt with, the rest of the mission becomes all about slowly baiting the enemy units towards me. The stealth fighter blue team starts with is essential for this battle, as the enemy has no fighters to shoot it down. This is one of the main reasons I selected Olaf as the Blue Moon CO. Not only does the stealth fighter get extra firepower in the snow, but I really don't want it to burn twice the fuel. I intentionally let green team take a lot of damage so that I can delay the first dual strike with Sasha. But the second dual strike is impossible to prevent. I simply don't have enough money or units to build up market crash any further. I have to eat the global damage dealt by Clone Olaf's Winter Fury, but luckily I don't end up losing a single unit during the dual strike. After that, this map becomes a very slow game of cat and mouse. I have to destroy all the mini cannons in order to advance into the enemy's base, which takes a long time, but in the end I'm able to mop up the enemy forces, and on day 20, with no losses, I bomb the last unit to earn myself a victory against Clone Olaf. Mission 24, Pincer Strike, sees us facing yet another clone CO. This time around, we're up against Drake on an absolutely massive map. We control two teams here, the red team in the south and the blue team in the north. The blue team is in a bit of a rough spot though, as they're cornered in by countless rockets, artillery and battleships. It looks bleak, but it won't stay that way for long. For the red team, I pick Drake and Olaf. We're about to unleash a serious climate catastrophe on these black hole suckers. For the blue team, I pick, um, yeah, I know, huge surprise. L let's get started. The first thing I need to do on this map is to try and move the red units to the north to help out their blue allies. There's a lot of rockets, artillery, and battleships on this map, and there's so much that can go wrong. 
Luckily, on day three, as the AI tanks over from Jugger to Drake, rain starts falling, and it will stay this way for the rest of the match. This is good for us because it causes fog of war, meaning the blue team can now use the forest for cover and get into a better position to assault the indirect forces. As the red team arrives to assist, I literally perform a pincer strike, wiping out almost every single indirect in the north, except for the enemy battleship. This does build up the enemy's power meter quite a bit, but luckily the blue team actually has a very solid income on this map. So by the time Sasha pops her first market crash, she's almost banked up 50,000 funds, which completely wipes out the enemy's power meter. Clearing out the enemy indirects is only the first challenge of this map, however. Soon after, the enemy arrives with many scary units, including a mega tank and a bunch of Uzium. And things start to feel very crammed up there. I also have to deal with multiple naval threats in the south, and I'm also being pressured by an enemy medium tank which threatens to gobble up my infantry. Luckily, Drake and Olaf's dual strike comes in at the perfect time. While it doesn't have a unique name or any special synergy bonus, it deals 4 HP of global damage to the enemy in a single turn, which is absolutely bonkers. The double turn is the cherry on top, really. As an added bonus, during Olaf's turn, the fog goes away briefly, allowing me to assess the enemy unit's positions, which is very helpful. Though I do lose the vision again once Drake's Typhoon rolls in. At this point, all I need to do is capture the airport with the blue team, swap over to Colin and start spamming out stealth fighters. The enemy has no airports on this map, so there's nothing that can challenge the stealth fighters once they hide. One by one, I systematically wipe out every single enemy unit until day 17 rolls in. And without a single loss to report, I blast the enemy's final infantry to earn myself a victory. Mission 25, Ring of Fire, is a return of a gimmick that I absolutely despise. A volcano map. Man, why do they always have to include a volcano map? In fact, this time around we're facing two volcano maps at once, since this is a split-screen battle with another volcano in it. Luckily, I now know that losses incurred on the second front doesn't matter, so I couldn't care less about this fight. All that matters is the main front, and this map has grit written all over it. Just look at it. You start out with a bunch of artillery and rockets, and the mission is to blast your opponent to pieces before 18 days pass. This is normally a pretty tricky mission to do, but with grit's extended range and firepower, it becomes an absolute breeze. I do have to send some units over to the second front, as while I don't care about losses, I still don't want to lose, as that means the CO there will join the enemy CO on the main front. And that CO happens to be Clone Kanbai, which would be pretty bad for me. So I send whatever forces I can spare to join Javier on the second front, as he tries his best to beat Kanbai in a battle that doesn't really matter. There is some strategy involved in what units I target on the main front. Killing infantry first is actually pretty essential, lest they survive to go on to capture the neutral bases, which will make this mission pretty much impossible. Another thing about this battle is that your indirects will actually run out of ammo pretty fast, and you only have a single APC to resupply them. So you do need to plan out your APC movement somewhat, unless you just want your rockets to sit there and be useless. The Uzium are also a bit annoying. Once they start coming into play, you have to focus fire them a lot, as they hardly take any damage from indirects. But there aren't that many of them, and by the time they become a threat, uh, they're usually the only units left on the map, so it doesn't really matter that much. So yeah, this, this mission is pretty easy, actually. There's no chance of dying here unless you mess up really hard. And while it takes a long while to clean up the last few remaining units, I actually end up beating the main front before the second front which is uh, pretty hilarious. On day 15, with no losses, I destroy the final Lucium to clear the map. Oh, uh, yeah, by the way, that volcano gimmick didn't even matter once. Great map design there, Dual Strike. Mission 26, Surrounded, is the final clone battle in the campaign, and the last boss of this arc is none other than Andy. Poor guy just had to get cloned again, didn't he? This is an absolute brain twister of a map. The enemy has four bases surrounding you on all sides, and the mission is to capture four comm towers, one in each corner of the map. Trying to get all the bases at once is not going to work, so we have to prioritize the ones we want to do first. 
We control two teams of COs in this map, and I'm going to be extremely original here by selecting Kambay and Sonya for the red team, and Sasha and Colin for the blue team. This map is all about using units creatively and effectively, knowing which ones are best suited for what job. I immediately destroy the pipe runner with my rocket, and then send some units to the northeastern base, which is the easiest to take. But I also send some of my units to the east. The blue team is mostly stuck being passive for a while in the middle, but I also have to evacuate a mech in the northern base with an APC to prevent it from being taken out. Using your battlecopters effectively is key in this mission. I found that I can completely cut off the west part of the map, as there's only ground vehicles there with no anti-air, and the only entry into my base is via a small choke point in the mountains. This makes the map a lot easier, as I can focus exclusively on the other fronts without having to worry about my base being destroyed. There is a lot of trial and error involved in this map, however. A single misplaced unit is usually a reset, since the enemy starts out with four comb towers under their control, translating into a 40% increase of firepower. This in particular makes Kindle's units on cities devastating, since they effectively get 80% extra firepower, which is enough for most of her vehicles to one-shot mine. Each unit must therefore be placed with the utmost care to make sure they don't die. And I do die a lot in this mission. I probably restarted at least 10 times. I know, I'm not going to show all of them. Not only do I have to place my units perfectly, but I also have to ensure Sasha participates in enough combat to build up her market crash, which is a big challenge on this map. Furthermore, if Andy is the CO in charge, he will actually activate his dual strike both during and after he's done with his turn, since it repairs HP, meaning it's far more difficult for me to prevent it. Dealing with the two initial southern battlecopters is the biggest challenge of this map, but once they fall and I'm done destroying the Neo tank guarding the base, this map becomes a lot more bearable, but still far from trivial, as I still need to move my units with the utmost care. Once I start capping the comb towers, however, the mission becomes a lot less scary as enemy firepower drops, meaning my vehicles aren't as likely to get destroyed. Things get a little bit dicey towards the end of this map, but luckily my battle standard comes in at the perfect moment, as I'm about to get overwhelmed on multiple fronts. The double turn combined with the insane firepower and defense boost means I'm able to clean up a lot of units. However, due to all the damage I inflict, the enemy do get their dual strike. However, I've eliminated so many units at this point that the enemy is not able to kill off one of mine even with a double turn, though they come pretty close. The fact that Kumbai went last with Samurai Spirit sure helped a lot. After this dual strike, the rest of the map becomes an absolute formality. On day 10, with no losses, I capped the final comb tower to claim my victory. Rest in pieces again, Clone Andy. Mission 27, for the future, is the second to last chapter in the campaign, and this time we finally go up against the big bad himself. The guy who replaced Sturm, the mastermind behind the Omega Land War. And it is... an old fart in a wheelchair. <laughs> yeah, I was disappointed when I saw him too. Von Bolt is a boring villain both in story and gameplay. His day-to-day -day is just an exceedingly simple 10% bonus to firepower and defense, and his superpower, Ex Machina, is just a bad version of Meteor Strike. Talk about disappointing. This map plays out very similarly to Hot Pursuit from Advanced Wars 2, where you have the CO in the middle taking a big pounding from the big bad, while the two other COs are moving up on the flanks. Your objective is to destroy a single black obelisk in the north, but it's protected by a mega tank and some Uzium, so it's not as simple as just running a bomber over there. You actually have to clear out most of the enemies in the area in order to blast it. The CO in the middle starts next to three comm towers, and for this reason, there's no better man to tank the center than Javier, backed up by his Dame Jess. I always thought it was kind of cute how both their alternate outfits show them holding their jacket under their arm. <laughs> Just a cute little detail, I noticed. Anyway, for the blue team on the left, I'm picking Grit and Olaf, since they start with both a battleship and a carrier. And for the green team, I'm going with the Storm Watchers, Eagle and Drake. Yeah, that's right, no Colin or Sasha for this one. Von Bolt is completely on his own, so there's no enemy dual strikes to crash, so I can play around with some other COs for this map for once. Von Bolt starts out with an absolutely massive ground army, but his AI is actually more on the defensive side, so he won't charge you with everything at once, especially not if you zone him out with some indirects. This is helpful because it gives you time to set up your units in a proper formation to deal with his first push. Grit and Eagle are responsible for taking out the mini cannons, black crystals, and pipe runners on the flanks, so Javier can advance forward. 
After I've successfully capped all three central com towers, Von Bolt's Ex Machina is ready. But all I need to do is pop Tower Shield to give Javier 70% increased defense and immunity from indirect fire, and then draw the Ex Machina away from the center by clumping up a bunch of units at my base. I don't know if Ex Machina is completely similar to Meteor Strike and how it targets things, as I'm not that familiar with the intricate coding of Dual Strike, but there certainly does seem to be an element of randomness to where it lands, so I'm assuming it works in a similar way. In case you don't know, Sturm's Meteor Strike from Advanced Wars 1 and 2 has three different ways of targeting units. It can either prioritize indirect units, go after units HP, or try to destroy value. I made an entire video on this if you want to check it out. While the old man in the wheelchair helplessly flails his fists against the Conquistador from Green Earth, Eagle and Grit are easily able to roll up their flanks and eliminate most of the units in their path. I'm even able to dart into the rear with a few air units and see if I can snipe the obelisk, but the Megatank Anusium station there makes it very hard for me to do that, so I just use the air units to harass Von Bolt's economy, as he doesn't actually have a lot of income or infantry. As the second X Machina is getting ready, I once again pop Tower Shield with Javier and move my units into a clump formation to draw it away from the front. And it works beautifully. X Machina is just incredibly pathetic when it doesn't hit an important target. At least Meteor Strike would weaken a bunch of your units permanently, but the 3 HP of damage that X Machina deals isn't that big a deal and is easily repaired up. The 70% defense gained from Tower Shield is also just completely bonkers. It doesn't matter what units Von Bolt sends at me. Mega Tanks, Neo Tanks, or Pipe Runners, they deal no damage, which is hilarious. The rest of the map is just a slow process of me inching forward with Javier and advancing Grit's armada towards the obelisk while Eagle flies around sniping air units. And slowly but surely, I just start eliminating the old fart off the map. Towards the end, I decide to finish in style with two consecutive dual strikes. First, I activate Green Flash with Javier and Jess to completely stomp anything Von Bolt has left in the center of the map. And then I follow it up with Stormwatch from Eagle and Drake to get a triple turn which almost wipes out every single unit situated around the Black Obelisk, though I'm not quite able to take it down. Grit then follows it up with a snipe attack to clear away the final units and even damages the Black Obelisk a little. And then finally, on day 14, with no losses, I smash the Black Obelisk with a Drake Stealth Fighter to claim my victory. A fitting end to a silly map. At long last, we have arrived at the final mission, Means to an End. Here we go up against the final boss of Dual Strike, a massive pile of turd that Von Bolt shot out after forgetting to take his Alzheimer meds. It's a ridiculously ugly looking final chapter and an incredibly dissatisfying ending to an otherwise cool campaign. This map is just incredibly large and it feels so empty, as Von Bolt doesn't really start with any units at all, aside from some Uzium and some mechs. He doesn't even have more than two bases and no cities at all. Seriously, look at him. He has an income of 2,000. This just feels very anticlimactic. To win this mission, we have to destroy the three weak points of the Grand Bolt. That's what the giant Usium is called, by the way, and it will momentarily spawn little Usium out of its uh, openings out of set days. Yucky. So it's important to not get too close to it, as they will ambush you. Meanwhile, another CO has to do battle on the secondary screen to destroy three black crystals, which will render the Grand Bolt vulnerable to attack. But this is a forced AI battle. You can't control it directly. So that feels kind of dumb. I don't really know why they designed this mission this way. Now, there is a time limit of 24 days, and while this may not seem like a tough time requirement, it can actually creep up on you very fast, as the secondary CO can take a while to finish up the other screen, so don't underestimate it. You might have to send some units their way to help out. To give myself a bit of an added challenge for this final chapter, I decided to pick Flak as my main CO, because damn, they really shafted my boy in Duel Strike. For his partner, I select Lash, because believe it or not, they have a unique dual strike in this game, and I really want to show it off. Now, I do shit on this map a lot, but the start is actually a little rough, as Von Bolt attacks you with multiple mechs right off the bat, and the Usium is coming closer with each turn, and once they arrive, they do complicate things a little bit. The answer to this early assault is just to spam out a bunch of battlecopters. Von Bolt can't afford any Antire, so just keep building them up until you clear out the units around your base. It will happen sooner or later. There's also a bunch of properties to the south which Von Bolt is capping with some infantry, so it's important to send a battlecopter down there at some point to interrupt them, but that's not really hard to do at all. 
Now, it is important to clear away most of Von Bolt's Usium before the first Ex Machina comes in. If it happens to strike units that are close to Usium, that could mean a reset. So I activate Brute Force to take out some of the Usium, but sadly, as I live by the flak, I sometimes also die by the flak, as his bad luck can really screw you over when trying to target fire down Usium. On my second try, it goes a lot better, and I get much better rolls. Meanwhile, Lash is getting absolutely shellacked on the second front, and it looks really bad. But keep in mind that Kindle doesn't have any bases, so she can't reinforce her army, so it's only a matter of time until Lash wins out. Still, I do send a bunch of infantry over to her side to give her some cannon fodder against Kindle. It does help a lot. Once I've eliminated most of the Usium, I start pushing out towards the Grand Bolt. There's not a lot of units coming my way, but I still have to be careful where I place them, as the map is quite open, and a single anti-air coming within range of my infantry means a reset. Realizing I don't really need any more units, I start building bombers, and I send them over to the second front to speed it up, as the time requirement is actually starting to creep up on me a bit. I pop a barbaric blow to help clean up some Usium, but then disaster strikes as Von Bolt's Ex Machina targets a bunch of my units right next to some Usium, actually screwing me over and forcing a reset. Man, I must admit, I never thought about how Von Bolt's power was actually made to work perfectly in synergy with Usium. It actually makes a lot more sense why they designed it the way they did now. At this point, though, I've all but figured this map out, and it's not hard to do at all, just kind of tedious. I completely clean up the main front by the time Lash wins her battle, and with her arrival over to the main scene, I get an instant dual strike. And I couldn't think of a better way to end this campaign but to activate the hilariously named Bruce Cruz which allows me to smash the Grand Bolt into tiny little pieces. On day 23, with one day left to go, and zero losses, I smash the Grand Bolt once, twice, and thrice to earn myself a grand victory. So here we are again at long last, the ending of another ridiculously long challenge video. These do seem to grow bigger with each one, don't they? So I guess I could answer the question now. Can you defeat Dual Strike without losing a single unit? Yes. Yes you can. Quite easily too, I might add, though some missions certainly gave me a hard time. If anything though, this playthrough has just enforced my stance on how utterly broken this game is. Dual Strike is a lot of fun for sure, you can do a lot of wacky things, but balance is one thing they absolutely threw out the window. The fact that I was able to cheese the campaign this hard without even utilizing the broken skills should really say something about the state of this game. Anyway, I hope you guys had a ton of fun, and if you actually watched this entire video from start to finish in one go, I salute your dedication, I hope it was worth your time. Let me know in the comments if you actually did. Now, I had a ton of fun creating this video, and I poured about a month of editing work into it. So if you did have fun watching it, please consider leaving a like, a comment, and consider subscribing to the channel if you aren't already. It's nice to see that the YouTube algorithm is actually rewarding long-form content, because to me, these are actually the most satisfying videos to make. So if you want to see more content like this, you know what to do. I suppose at this point, there's only a single challenge left for me to do in this form, and let me tell you, I'm not looking forward to it, but I believe it is doable. Anyway, if you want to check out the other Advanced Wars challenge runs I've done, I've done Advanced Wars 2 as well as Days of Ruin. You can click on the playlist in front of you to go watch them if you want. But until next time, my name is Finn Mengs, thank you for watching, bye bye